welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer interview here at Gen Con 2019. I'm Callie Wright and I'm here with Adam from XYZ Lab and he's super excited to share. He's a co-designer of Arch Rod Ravelry. So how's it going at the con, Adam? It's going great. Uh, you know, it's, the con's only been open for a few hours and already we are swamped. There are people uh, mobbing the table for Arch Ravelry. They have been all morning, which is awesome to see. Um, lots of crafters, lots of knitters, lots of crocheters who are super excited about the idea that there is now a game that is made for them. Yes, I am super excited too. I do some crochet. Uh, Michael's grandmother taught me actually. Super excited. Yeah, we're definitely getting crushed here, so we'll try and make this quick and get everyone to see the game and explore it. So tell us a little bit about Arch Ravelry. Yeah, so Arch Ravelry is a uh, competitive crafting game for two to four players. So the goal of the game is to be the one to earn the most points by completing projects. So the projects require you to have certain items that you have crafted. In this case, triplets requires three bears. So the way that you do that is the game is action selection based. So you've got a player board. Each player has unique asymmetric abilities that line up to their crafting archetype. So we have the thrifty board out here. So she's going to be really good at shopping. She's going to get the most stuff when she shops. So on your turn, you'll choose which action you're going to do. In this case, we are shopping. So we would take some cards from the Yarn Bazaar, which usually there's a big set of six cards laid out here that you can choose from. You'll take some cards from this, uh, from the Yarn Bazaar, you'll discard them, you'll get, some, you'll get some bits of yarn and put them in your bowl. And then at the end of the, and that's the first part of the turn. The second part of the turn is you then restock the Yarn Bazaar with cards from the deck. Sometimes, some actions or special projects will come up, sometimes just yarn will come up. Then, on your next turn, say you could craft, in this case, craft two, I would discard from my yarn bowl the correct color yarn according to the patterns that are down here on your board. Once I do that, I would collect a chit that had, that's worth points that I could then use to complete the projects. Person who earns the most points from completing projects crafting items, learning their patterns, or completing something that we call uh, special requests in the game. Person who gets the most, the, makes the most points wins the game. Awesome, and how long does the game last, or how many rounds? So it's about 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, the, game is, the game length is based upon the number of projects you put in the project list. Ah, okay. So base game, I think we put in about two and a, roughly two and a half projects per player. And you can, you, you can shrink that or extend that if you want the game to go shorter or longer. Awesome. Well, I really love how you use the little colored <laughs> wooden yes. pieces to represent the yarn. That's really fun. If people want to find out more about our, our travelry, where should they go? Yeah, so you can go to our website, xyzgamelabs.com. Uh, you can also go to archravelry.com. Um, here at Gen Con, actually, we're running a, spe we, we're, we're running a special called Cast On. So if you, uh, for five dollars, you get an Arch Ravelry patch or pin. You got a pin right there. Backer, there's a backer right there, or, or a patch. And then you'll get in the cast on email email list, which means that you will be the first to know when the campaign goes live. The campaign's going live sometime in September. Mystery. Exactly. Maybe the first day of fall, because it's about crafting. That would be fun. That would make sense. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and then you'll still get your $5 back at the end of the campaign. So when the campaign funds, anyone who did cast on will get five bucks back at the end of the campaign. So you're kind of holding your place in line and yes. getting something out of it. Yes, you get a, you get a patch or a pin. <laughs> Fine. Our, uh, and you're the co-designer of this game. Yeah. What, what inspired you to uh, create this game? So uh, the number one inspiration was uh, a couple years ago we were at a con. We were actually demoing our very first game, Robot Lab. And uh, uh, someone who was a crafter was like, you know, I always wish there was more, there were more games about knitting, because I think it'd be really fun to have a game about knitting. And for some reason, that just stuck with me for a long time. And we went through like four or five different variations of what this game was, and ended up coming to this. There's actually like a lot of math and different things involved in knitting and crocheting. So I see like the connection is there. Yeah. It's really fun. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Adam, for sharing. Is there anything else you want to say to the fans? Uh, I would say uh, Unfiltered Gamer is great. I love you guys.
you, we've been working with you since our very first game, Robot Lab, and, uh, and you guys are wonderful. So keep it up, great content, and I'm very excited to see where you go next. Thank you so much. Well, have an amazing con. We're going to let these, this horde of people come in here and see more of the games now. Uh, thank you, and as always, we look forward to seeing you guys next time. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer interview here at Gen Con. I'm Callie, and I'm here today with Dominic from Cubicle 7. Hi, Dominic. Hello. How's it going? <laughs> I, it's going awesome for me. How about yourself? Fantastic. It was great to be here. Awesome. So what are you most excited to share here at Gen Con? This one. Uh, <laughs> this is the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay starter set. It's your perfect introduction to this wonderful, grim and perilous world. Um, it's We've designed it really just to be a, yeah, that really accessible, get into the game as quickly as possible. Um, there's a fantastic uh, first adventure that teaches you the game as you play through. Uh, we've got um, some great pre-generated characters that you'll have a lot of fun playing. Um, and the, it's such an experience. The, um, it's one of those adventures that you'll look back on and be laughing about um, and wincing quite a lot um, in many, for many years to come. Um, so the, the, then uh, once you've uh, played through that adventure, which takes about two or three sessions, uh, there's 10 big adventure seeds in there, sort of full pages that give you loads to get on with. Um, there's also um, a guide to the town of Ubersreich, which is a wonderful and horrible place. Um, and yeah, there's just basically so much adventuring packed into this box, it's hard to believe. Um, and then dice and tokens and all those great handouts and stuff like that. So uh, this is what I'm most excited to be showing off at Gen Con. Woo! Thank you so much. Uh, so I really like you said there's pre-generated characters mm. that I know for me it's like a little intimidating when you don't know, okay, yeah. what should I do? What should yeah. that should I choose? <laughs> yep. Oh, definitely. Um, and what we've, the, I think that you know, the, the, it's great to be able to just like pick the, you know, that's the one, I'm going for the one with the spiky hair and that's going to be great. Um, what we've also put in this is that there's some personalization for each of the pre-gens, so you can decide what your character's secret is or what their kind of motivation might be. So um, yes, there's um, good pre-gens with some really nice, easy choices you can make to make them your version of that character. Awesome, and you're the co-designer co of this, correct? Uh, yeah, I'm the, uh, yeah, Wuffrup, uh, we say Wuffrup, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is a bit of a mouthful, so Wuffrup. Um, yeah, co-designer. I get all the best jobs. <laughs> awesome. And so what, what inspired you to create this game or what makes it a little unique from other things you've done before? Um, I think that the uh, yeah, I got into um, to role playing through Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay First Edition. So uh, I, I don't know, I was 11. Um, I think I, um, Talisman I started with and then Blood Bowl and then saw Wofferup and my fate was sealed. So um, yeah, the... Uh, um, it, it's a big personal one for me, so it was just yeah, a fantastic privilege and a huge pleasure to um, be able to revisit it and um, yeah, to put my edition of the game together. It's been fantastic. Awesome. So if people want to learn more or they're not here at the con, where should they go to find out more information? Uh, it's cubicle7games.com. Um, there's everything on there, there's loads, and we're adding to it all the time. We're, we're building a big um, section on, on advice and tips and techniques for role-playing as well. So if you're new to role-playing games, um, there's you know, some great advice on getting started and um, your character. We're adding to that all the time, so um, yeah, well worth the look. That's really awesome. I really appreciate the focus on bringing more people into <laughs> role-playing. Yep. Thank you so much for sharing, Dominic. Thank Is there you. anything else you want to say? No, I would never when I'm put on the spot. Um, um, uh, I watched Vice on the way over on the plane. That was fab. So check that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful con. And as always, we look forward to seeing you guys next time. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer interview here at Gen Con. I'm Callie, and I'm here with Matt Hudson from Direwolf Games. Hi, Matt. Hi, how are you? Great. How are you, and how is the con going? Uh, it's busy. We're off to a fast start here on day one. Uh, it, Gen Con is sort of both a marathon and a sprint, so you have to start fast, go hard, and last all weekend, which is always the hard part. Yeah. Well, you guys here at Dire Wolf have an amazing booth, lots of technology. Tell me, what are you guys most excited to share about here at Gen Con? Uh, we've got a lot going on. Uh, one of the things that is near and dear to our hearts is Raiders of the North Sea, which just released this week uh, on Nintendo Switch, iOS and Android phones and tablets, and uh, PC and Mac on Steam. So it's all cross-platform digital adaptation of a really excellent tabletop board game, uh, which is something that we're very passionate about at Direwolf and very excited to bring into the world. 
So tell us a little bit about the gameplay. What kind of mechanic? Sure. So uh, Raiders of the North Sea is a worker placement game. Uh, in which in every turn you both place a worker and remove a worker and by doing that you create a little engine of value where you can get different resources to fuel your Viking warband uh, as they go on raids across the North Sea to bring honor and glory to your chieftain. Uh, ultimately at the end of the game you're competing against other Viking warbands to impress the chieftain the most uh, which will determine who wins. I can actually... Yeah, let's see thing. a little bit of the gameplay if you can. Sure. So we'll hop into an AI game here. Whenever we do a digital adaptation of a board game, one of the first things we look for is not just how can we translate the mechanics of, you know, here's on me playing a board game on a yeah. computer. It's really how can we bring the world to life? Uh, and from the very beginning, Raiders has an amazing art style and some really unique stuff going on that makes it a, a, a natural fit for us and a really exciting thing to adapt. Yeah, one of the things I look for in technology adaptations is does this improve the experience of the game? Like the technology is used as a tool mm -hmm. to help to help bring the game to life, which is great. I hear the same thing that you're saying. Yeah, you know, one of the things with a game like Raiders is when you can actually create a world that you explore, it can it feels like it takes you beyond the board, right? And kind of into the environment where the strategy uh, that underlines the, the board game, which is amazing, uh, really feels like it pulls you into the world in a very natural and smooth and intuitive way. And that's you know ultimately what we're sort of looking for when we embark on this. We're launching at Direwolf a new slate of digital adaptations of board games uh, that includes not only Raiders, but things like Yellow and Yangtze, Root, Sagrada, Wings of Glory, Mage Knight, and some really exciting titles that give us a chance to kind of dig in to all the different kinds of ways that you can translate a board game into a, a 21st century video game. Got me really excited. Sagrada is one of my favorite games. Sagrada, Sagrada is amazing. <laughs> Over there, maybe you can see, uh, we're just releasing the uh, gameplay trailer for Sagrada and Root this weekend. We've got those playing on screens over there, so those are worth checking out. It's again, you know, both Sagrada and Root, like Raiders, have amazing visuals and amazing, really unique and distinct underlying art style that gives us so much to kind of latch into and explore on the art front as we're bringing it into a 3D environment. Awesome. Was there anything else you wanted to share specifically about Raiders? Like, what's going on here? So in, in Raiders, this is your, your village. In every turn, you will place a worker to one of the buildings and remove a worker. Those generate the resources that you use to go uh, raid throughout <laughs> different establishments throughout the North Sea. One of the other, uh, see if I can go back. One of the other things that's really cool about the digital adaptation of Raiders is it comes with a campaign. Uh, and this is new and unique to the digital game, where if you play in the campaign, you'll be given a series of new objectives where each game will sort of put its own little spin on how you can achieve victory and what you want to be doing over the course of a game. Uh, and for established Raiders players uh, who already know and love the tabletop game, this provides some sort of fun, unique, new leveling up challenges uh, as you progress through the world. So uh, it, it kind of offers different ways to play. Yeah, so. it's a sort of new twist to play where we put minor twists on some existing mechanics, rebalance some of the rating locations, some of the cards, some of the resource objectives, and it's a it's a fun and quick way once you're an established player or even if you're learning the game to kind of hook into new and deeper ways to experience the underlying gameplay. So it, it's really fun. So like in this one, uh, there's an incentive for rating harbors and uh, it kind of creates a scaled down version of the game that plays very quickly. Uh, in the next scenario after that, uh, there's a food shortage going on. So you can't exchange food for resources in the longhouse, but food gives you victory point bonuses. And so it kind of changes up your objectives and makes it so that it's always fresh. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing. If people want to learn more about Raiders or any of the other awesome stuff you got going on, where should they go? Uh, Raiders is on basically every digital storefront right now, and you can also learn more at direwolfdigital.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I hope you have a great con. You do. Enjoy the show. <laughs> All right. And that, with that, we'll see you guys next time. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer interview here at Gen Con. I'm Callie, and I'm here today with Chris Leader, the director of fun at Calliope Games. Hi, Chris. Hello. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing, and how is the con going for you? 
It is fantastic. We are having a great time here. We're playing all the new games, and we are giving a sneak peek at the production copy of Suro, Phoenix Rising, the newest version of Suro. Uh, it's the third in the line, and it's coming out this September into stores. So we're very excited because what you see here came straight from the factory, and this is all final components. That's awesome. I must tell you, Suro, it's one of those games that really got me and my family into gaming. So easy to pick up and learn and just fun to replay over and over again. So thank you for that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's what we found. Suro is something that really resonates with people. The first game um, is a gateway game that people can can play really quickly. And, and you know, you, you put it down, you're like, grab three tiles, play a tile, move it, grab another tile. People go, that's it? Yeah. And then stay on the board. Don't go off. That's it. So. You know, that, that really caught on. Suro the Seas came out, and that introduced the dice and the daikaiju and all that, and it was very luck-based. People loved it. Some people were like, I'm not sure that I like the luck about this so much. I kind of like the first one. And, and so we it split a little bit. When the time came to make a, make a third Suro game, we said, all right, we have to make this different from the others, but build on what's there. So this one doesn't have dice. There's not luck. This one's more of kind of like a manipulation puzzle game, and it adds some set collection elements that aren't in the other games. All right. These pieces look really cool, too. Could you tell me a little bit about them, and and uh, what, what do these do? I'm super curious. <laughs> sure. So in the game, the story is um, you are phoenixes. An angry god has stolen stars from the night sky, and now you are phoenixes. The, the people of the, of the earth are plunged into darkness, so they sent these... Uh, paper lanterns, these glowing paper lanterns up into the sky, and then these phoenixes appear, and they're all playful and having fun. They dart from one to the other, and when they reach them, they actually send them up into the heavens to become a new star. Oh, so, cool. So the, the idea is you're trying to go around and, and create new stars, and the first player to create seven stars has made a new constellation. You finish that round, and then whoever has the most stars is the winner. So in this now, I should say, you also can win by eliminating the others, but it's a little bit more tricky because you're phoenixes, right? And what the, the defining thing about phoenixes is that they can rise from the ashes. So every player is going to start with one of these life tokens. They kind of look ashy, right? So if during the game your phoenix goes off the board, on your next turn you can spend your life token to come back onto the board in a different place. So. You, you, unlike the regular Suro, it's not immediate player elimination. And in fact, you have to unlearn a little about what you know about Suro, because when you play the original Suro, you're like, I don't want to go off this board no matter what. In this one, if all of the lanterns are over here and you're over there, you may choose to send yourself off so that you can come back onto the board over here. And that's a, it's a tactical thing to do to try to get the advantage. I noticed the pieces are a little different too in that there's more lines and spaces where lines are going and so some of them aren't connecting which is different as well. Yeah, that's true. And and part of that is this this tray system that we have here, this new board and we patented it. This is a whole brand new thing. It allows us to do this. It allows us to flip and rotate the tiles without affecting any of the tiles around it. And the reason we did that is because each tile one side is like classic Suro. It has the lines going off the edges this way. The other side actually has diagonal movement. So your Suro, your, your phoenixes, you're flying around in this game. You don't want to just go in you know, static little lines like this. You want to kind of wheel around and do things like a bird would do. Well, when you play this game, let's say I start over in this spot here. When I play my first tile, and I choose to move, I immediately hook up to like a roller coaster. I can start to fly and move around until I reach a dead end and I stop. And then any of the spaces that I move through, I create a star there. I move this lantern to a new spot. So in this case, I'm going to put it right in front of myself and I'm going to score the star and put it in front of me. So you actually start with the middle of the board pre-populated with these tiles so that when you start to connect to them, you get that kind of fun roller coaster effect that used to come in the second half of Suro games. You get it right away. Um, but, but when you dead end like this, on your next turn, you're going to actually flip and rotate the tile that's in front of you. There you, you go. Back down, and then you can continue, and I would go all the way to here, oops, and then I would score this lantern right here. So, um, 
and I would do this. I'm just going to play the game because, you know, it's fun. <laughs> Boom, I do that, and I would score this one. So you may be able to line it up and actually get two or three lanterns in a turn, and when that happens, you're like, you know, pumping your fists in the air, and you're like, yes, I did it. So, um, yeah, so there's still a lot of the foundational elements of Suro. You're still playing tiles. You're still moving along the path, um, and you can eliminate others by putting a, a tile in front of them and causing them to go off the board. You can send them off and make them use a life token, but you're really also aiming yourself at different places on the board, which is brand new for Suro. We haven't seen that before. So this is something new. Yeah, it feels like it elevates the strategy because you can kind of, if you remember what's on the other side too, and you can kind of plan your path around. Super cool, thank you for sharing. Absolutely, we're really excited about it and we're, we're excited to see that so many people, I mean, it's our 10th anniversary here at Calliope Games. So wow, this, congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're, we're celebrating our 10th. So this is like a great little way to really celebrate the brand, both Calliope and Suro, with a brand new addition in the Suro line. All right, so if people want to learn more about Suro Phoenix Rising, where should they go? Um, they can go to calliopegames.com. Uh, they can check it out on Board Game Geek. They can go follow us on Twitter and Facebook, uh, and we're always happy to give information on this stuff. And the game will be in stores in September, so it's not that far down the road. It feels far right now, but it's really not. It really is, and it'll be August before. Well, it is August. It's Oh, my gosh, it's August. So, yes, next month. It'll be available next month. That's crazy. Well, thank you so much for sharing, Chris. Uh, any other shout-outs you want to give the other games you guys have here? We have uh, Spy Master, which is by Seth Johnson. It's an I Split You Choose kind of manipulation game. It's really great. We've got Everyone Loves a Parade by Mike Mulvihill, where you get to craft floats and put them in a parade. And then we've got Ship Shape by Rob Davio, um, which is a game where you're uh, bidding to get these really cool kind of puzzle piece things and stack them in your... your there's, there's no way to describe it properly. Just go buy Ship Shape and play it, and, uh, and, and you'll enjoy it. That's all there is to it. All right, thank you so much, Chris, uh, and thank you to our audience. Uh, this is Callie signing out from Unfiltered Gamer, and I as always look forward to seeing you guys next time. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer interview here at Gen Con. I'm Callie, and I'm here with JC from Fox Mind. Hi, JC. Hello, how are you? I'm great. <laughs> how are you, and how is the con going? Very good, like it's just started now, but already you have a plenty of people lining up to play games, so that's amazing. That's awesome, and you guys have a lot of games that you're showing off here today. What are some of your top picks that you guys are showing off? The top pick is definitely Bermuda Pirates. It's the game we have just in front of us. It's definitely the one people are expecting for and want to try. So basically the game is a magnetic dexterity game for families, which is already something that attracts the attention. And the way you play is that you have your little magnetic boat and you're trying to roam the oceans and grab treasures of different colors and bring it back to your own island. The way you do it is that one finger, you push the back of your boat up until you reach an obstacle. So let's say I'm pushing like this. I'm, and I've reached, I've reached an obstacle, meaning that I need to go back here and place a buoy. Those are buoys players have to mark the traps. Under the boards, there are 20 traps total, and you need to try to avoid those. And you push from the back like this, not from the top, but from the back like that. Yes. You were you're caught. When, once you reach a dock, you can load a treasure. And you can decide if you want to go back to secure your treasure, or you can try and push your luck and grab some more. So let's say I'm going for more here. I'm able to reach. I need to be careful. I have a second one here. And let's say I'm pushing like that. Oh, uh, when it. Yeah, but I've, lo I've lost it. I've lost it. But at some point, you reach a trap. I show up. That was a bad example here, but, oh. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I'll show it like that. It, the treasures are spilled out, meaning that once you have a treasures on your boat and your boat gets trapped, it's going to spill out in the ocean like this. Once they're spilled out, you go back here and these stay in the ocean, meaning that as you play, you get more and more treasures spilled out in the ocean and they are up for grabs for anyone who wants to take them. So this is the magic of the game and people are wondering, well, once I know the paths, 
is it easy to play again and solve the, the, the problems without getting caught? The fun fact is that under these flags and under the board, there's underboards like these, four underboards that you can mix and swap around for over 250 ways to play the game. So there's no way you can have the same puzzle again. You never know where the traps are. And the thing is that in five minutes, you're able to explain that type of game. It's very easy, straightforward. Push your boat to the, the center island, grab your treasures, bring them back, win the game. That's it. Wait, how many treasures do you need to win? You need one of each color. So that's very, very easy. It's two to four players, seven and up, 20 minutes to play. It's a $30 game, so it's very affordable too. Awesome. And if people wanted to uh, learn more or purchase it, where should they go? Well, they can purchase it on most hobby stores or online. And also, if they want more info, they can go to our website to know where to buy it. Awesome. Is that foxmine.com? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Just make sure yeah. so they know. <laughs> well, thank you. This is really neat. I love the magnetic aspect. I love the replayability. Yeah. And I'm guessing like two to four players is great, right? And it seems pretty quick, too. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's very, very quick. And the thing is that young kids can enjoy it too without adults getting bored playing it. It's one of the main factors why our games are successful is that, yes, it's kid-oriented, but adults have a great time playing those games too. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing, JC. Is there anything else you want to say to the camera? Well, if people see this video and enjoy it, they can join our Facebook group, give us comments, and we'll be happy to reply to them. Awesome. Well, thank you so much and uh, enjoy the con. Thank you. And as always, we look forward to seeing you guys next time.